Pate State Speaker Series on the road in Chapel Hill. Coach, this is one I've waited on. Coach Mac Brown joins us, and unlike some of the stops we've made, we've talked to some younger coaches, maybe coaches at new programs. You've been here a while, and you've got a lifetime in the sport, which translates to you can kind of say whatever you want to, (laughs) and you don't have someone slapping you on the wrist constantly. So I am very interested to talk with you about a whole lot of stuff that's going on right now. And you and I were just talking before we started rolling, so we might as well start here. On one hand, you've got guys like you who have seen several iterations of the sport and you've lived through several iterations as a coach. And then there are guys who just became head coaches in the last three or four years. And yet this last three or four years, there's probably been more change than at any point in the history of even your career. So what do you think is tougher, trying trying to adapt and evolve at your stage or being on the ground floor and brand new to the business like some of them are. Well, Josh, first let me say welcome and thank you for all you do for our sport. You you work so hard to, to get the right answers and, and ask the hard questions, and I like that. That That's what we need right now, and I, I appreciate you going and asking these questions at different places because it, it's stuff that needs to be answered. Um, I was griping about COVID when I was sitting here because nobody had ever had COVID before in sports. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm saying that we couldn't see our players. We couldn't practice. I didn't know if we were going to play in the season. And I'd just gotten out of TV and I asked my wife, Sally, I said, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, what, what am I doing? I'm not coaching. I'm just sitting here. She said, maybe you're supposed to be helpful at a time where everybody's wondering what to do. Maybe you're supposed to figure it out. Maybe you're supposed to help your kids get through it. Maybe you're supposed to help your sport get through it. And she said, and the ones that handle COVID the best are going to be the ones that win. So you can either gripe about it or you can be part of the solution. I feel the same way now. I feel very fortunate to be 50 years in this business. I love the sport. People say, why do you still coach at 72? I love the kids. I love the sport. I get mad at this and I get mad at this. And then when I go to eat lunch with the kids, I say, I I melt. They got me because how many people in their life can have a purpose to help change kids' lives? And I get to do that every day, and I got 120 of them. So I am so blessed. I love football. My brother was a football coach. My granddad, my dad were football coaches. That's all we've done in our whole lives. So this sport is really, really important to me. So I would say it's more on guys like me who have been head coaches 36 years and coached for 50 years to try to help some of the young ones that are, this is new for them. It's different for them, probably tougher than when I started because you got a whole lot more things to deal with. Um, so I think it's an advantage to someone like me who's seen it all but can help find the solutions a little bit easier and faster than others as long as you don't get frustrated. It doesn't do any good to be mad about it. It doesn't do any griping about something, just waste air, waste your time, it wastes your energy. And and we have to be careful when you get off on that that tangent, it doesn't do any good. And I I heard um, when I was a very young coach, Vince Dooley was coaching in the Gator Bowl his last game against Michigan State, and he just won 200 games. And they said at halftime, what is your advice to young head coaches? And I was a very young head coach, and he said... uh, um, you're going to have to take crisis and turn them into positives because you're going to have crisis as a head coach. And unless you, if you're going to gripe about the crisis and worry about the crisis instead of fixing them and making them positive, you're not going to make it. So my whole life, when somebody comes in with something tough, I said, got to fix it. Right now we've got some issues because we, we made some decisions at a high level without looking at the consequences. Who knows what was in that room the day they made those decisions? Maybe it was Congress. Maybe it was politics. Maybe it was lack of knowledge. I don't know. At one point, football coaches became athletic directors. And then football coaches would be really involved in the decision-making process. Grant, Grant Taft was one of the best at the American Football Coaches Association. I was fortunate enough to be on his board. Then I was fortunate enough to be the president. We got things done that were best for the sport. And the NCAA was all in. If we got a unanimous vote from the coaches, they were all in. So now we've got to get a lot of smart people together in a room 
and we've got to do it quickly. And we've got to got, we've got to start making decisions that are best for everybody. And we've got to put some common sense back in it, Josh. We've got, uh, players have never had it any better because they're getting paid. That's a good thing. Uh, but we should have guidelines because there's too much pressure on them about how much is this one getting paid. We have no transparency. Nobody knows who's really getting paid, so everybody thinks everybody's getting paid. I'll have a player come up and say, I can't believe you're paying him this. And I said, they're not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm, they're, they're really not. Uh, so we need some transparency. Uh, we need a plan. We need some guidelines. Uh, we're, we're headed toward an NFL model, and I got that. And they've, they've got a great model, and we don't have a model. We're no longer into amateurism. Our guys are being paid. The transfer portal went from you can transfer anywhere, anytime you want, to you can't, can't transfer anywhere. We went through that with Tez Walker this year. Uh, to now, eh, you can go back and transfer anytime you want. Um, so let's get a plan. Let, let's, let's get a plan that's productive for everybody. Um, and, and let's make it work instead of just griping about every little thing everybody says. Um, I, I went to a Nike meeting three weeks ago, a month ago, and a lot of our head coaches were sitting there. And the Nike executive walked in. The first thing he said is, college football has never been a better place. And I thought, hmm. hmm. And he said, it is great. More people watching it, more money coming in, more talk about realignment. Playoffs are going to be better than ever. College football's better than it's ever been. And I thought, you know what? He's right. He is right. Then he said, now we got some things we need to clean up, but all of us do in our lives. But let's don't take all the positives and let the negatives override the positives. Let's clean up our mess and make sure that we're doing what's best for our sport, which includes our fans, our universities, our kids, and our parents. We can't just throw those people out. We've got to look at everybody and what's best for everybody because everybody's involved in the sport. I'll ask you this question. We've been talking about it a lot on our show because uh, a fan asked me. He said, um, what is it you specifically love about college football? If you had to drill down, tell me what it is you think is great about it. So I said the spirit of the game. I think at its core is what distinguishes it from even the NFL and everything else. There's, there's no spirit like the spirit college football has. Now, you can call it tradition, pageantry, whatever the case may be. You're talking about how we've sort of deviated away from the amateur model and we go more towards an NFL light model. Uh, my personal concern is you kind of sacrifice that spirit in the process of trying to homogenize yourself the way the NFL looks. So I'll ask you twofold here. Number one, uh, what is it you would define as the thing you love the most about it? Not even maybe as a coach, just as a fan, as someone who loves the game. And number two, um, in this path, how do you make sure that enough of that is maintained? I love watching kids compete. I love that. I'll watch Western uh, Michigan and Central Michigan on Tuesday night. And I'll get home and sit there and I'll, I'll be focused and watch it because I love watching kids compete. So you endorse Maction. You love Maction. I, I, I love football. I love watching them play. I love what they learn from it. I, I love, I, I sat and watched uh, um uh, I won Purdue basketball the other night, women's basketball, because I wanted to see Caitlin Clark, and I wanted to see if Purdue could upset them, and I wanted to see. I'm, I'm so um, amazed by the 19 number one seeds that got beat in, in their conference tournaments. I'm amazed that a Yale can beat an Auburn. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed that that um, Oakland can beat Kentucky, and I thought it was Oakland, California. I was like everybody else. I, I'm, um, so, but, but that stuff happens and, and I'm constantly, my mind's working on why does that happen? It's so intriguing to me because you got to have an edge. You got to be prepared. You've got to respect your opponent and all those things that are important that, that really relate to our life relate to football. I love the pageantry. I, I cry at the national anthem. I cry after we win. I'm mad after we lose. I mean, I'm, I'm, you can just. We, we beat Duke in double overtime last year, and I, I was emotional in, in uh, talking to the reporter on the field after the game. Everybody thought I was going to quit. No, <laughs> I love beating Duke. I thought it was a great game, and, and I get into I don't think either team lost that game. We, we all won because we saw kids compete till the last second, and, and we loved what we saw. So why does somebody have to lose? 
we all won with, with that game. Um, so I, I think the, the pageantry, and, and I believe this, Josh, I really believe this. I don't think we're going to change and be more like the NFL because the kids didn't ask for this. NFL guys go into it knowing they're getting paid. No, not one player asked to be paid. This was on us. Adults made these decisions. So when, when fans tell me, uh, I don't want to watch them anymore, they're, they're just after the money. They're really not. They are wonderful young people who fight their guts out every day to do what's right. And we just happen to say we're going to pay you for it. Now, if somebody tells me, I, uh, Texas told me they're going to give me a huge raise after the national championship. I didn't ask for it. I don't know that it was best for the sport, but I darn sure wasn't going to turn it down. That's the kids. If you give for them some money, they're going to take it. But are they going to practice hard? Are they going to play hard? I don't believe the old that they'll walk out on you anymore and there's no loyalty. I, 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 don't, I don't believe all that. I love these kids. And, and I just think we've put a, a ton on their backs for mental health. And, and we need to start making sure that this, is, this thing gets simplified. I like to take complicated things and simplify them. And, and, and we're a little complicated right now, and we need to, we need to get it simplified for them. You were, um, you were in media, I believe, around the time the concept of opting out of bowl games really became popular. And so you got to sit at a desk and talk about it as a former coach. And unbeknownst to you, you were going to get back into coaching. But the point you're making there is taken because I remember at the time all the anger was at the kids. How dare Leonard Fournette opt out of this bowl game? Well, if you trace it back a couple of years, you have the advent of the playoff. And then you've got adults in the room who start calling any game not tied to the playoff meaningless. So the kids listen to that for a couple of years. And then they say, well, if the adults in the room are calling the games meaningless... Why should I play in the game? And then you try and make that point to people. And, oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. That's the kids. That's the kids. It's a good point you're making, though. Josh, it really, that, that's, a, that, that's a very confusing concept for me. Is because I'm all in to fight for your team. You wouldn't be where you are in the draft if it hadn't been for your team. So how can you buy into your team and then walk away? And then I look at it and I see guys get hurt and I say, eh, they're turning, they're, they're losing millions of dollars because they got hurt. We've, we've got insurance for them, but the insurance isn't going to cover what they would have made. So it gets really confusing for me because I've never coached in a mean, meaningless game. I've never played in a mean, meaningless game. If I go play pickup basketball, I want to win. I, I mean, that, that's just it. If you play ping pong, why play? They, they, they keep score for a reason. You want to win. So um, some people say they're not opting out, they're quitting their team. I get confused. We've had probably three, four kids opt out of our bowl every year. We had four young guys opt out of the Orange Bowl at North Carolina. We'd never been. And I think I was more shocked than anything else that that could happen. But I get it. Do, do I get mad? No. Do I love the kids? Absolutely. Uh, do I wish they'd play? Yeah, because it's for their team. And, and another thing I'm worried about a little bit, and it, it's kind of a, along the same line, I've got teammates that I love. I talk to them all the time. Tony Dungy spoke at our high school clinic the other day, and he said he's still got 25 guys that he's on a text chain with from his Minnesota college team. With all the transfers, especially in basketball, we're not going to see that anymore because you're not going to grow up with the guys. Yeah, and, and so they may not be your best man. They may not be in your wedding anymore. They, they may not be your best friend that you talk to once a week. And I hate that for guys because that's one thing that all of us who have played have camaraderie with those that we played with. I, I like that we don't have to beat around the bush with this with you. So if we look <laughs> back on the last couple of years at Carolina, I think most people would classify it as they've had – Good to really good offensive play. They've had good quarterback play over there. Defense hasn't been up to standard. It's kept them from achieving what that talent roster suggests they should have achieved. Special teams, kicking games specifically last year. Um, the look on your face says it all. You made moves to address both of those. How do you feel you're going to go about improving those parts of the program? Yeah, Josh, we've played really good offense in top 25, top 10 um, and should have won more games if we'd been better on defense. We've played 
We've been good at defense some, but at best we've been really inconsistent. And there's been some days we've been bad. We, we've had to score 40 points to win. Um, and then kicking game, we were bad three years ago, and then we were second in the league two years ago, and then last year we were bad again. It's just uh, so it's really interesting that that's another thing that drives me is we've been good. For North Carolina to win eight, nine games, that's good. That's, that's, that's been the, the standard for us, which isn't good. But that's been the height. Sometimes you win 10, maybe you won 11 a couple of times, but we're, 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 we're more six than nine. But nines, it's good, but it's not great. And we didn't come back to be good. So I'm passionate. Um, I call it passionate. My wife calls it obsessive. <laughs> uh, but um, it's so much fun to be challenged to figure out that defense. Why? Why have we been all over the place? Why? Why we? And, and Coach Fedora had better offensive players when we got here than defense. But we've been here. This is going on six years. We should be better than we are. So, so we've got to figure that out. We got to make sure we get it. A kicking game. Tony Dungy came in when he came the other day, and he said, "There's three things that you have to do to win. We all know them. We all talk about them. But do we emphasize them?" And he he said. Uh, you, you don't need to have any pre-snap penalties, and you don't need any post-whistle penalties. You're going to have some in between, but 75% of the penalties are before the snap of the ball. And Coach Bowden always used to tell me that. You've got to cut those out. That's lack of discipline. You're going to hold some. You're going to have a pass interference. But if you can't go off on the snap, if you can't line up right, if you can't keep from pushing a guy after the play, then you're not going to win games. So number one, cut penalties out. We've had too many here with smart kids. It wears me out. I've told our coaches, we bring in really bright kids to North Carolina, and then they're not disciplined. That's on us. And they got great families. So cut out the penalties. We need to have fewer than anybody in the ACC, and that hadn't been us. Second thing is you got to win the turnover battle. Everybody talks about it, but do you coach it? And you, you got to do that. And we protected the ball. We just haven't forced turnovers because we've been inconsistent on defense. If you don't stop the run on first down, you're not going to have the quarterback in bad shape on second and third down, and you're probably not going to get as many turnovers. So we've got to stop the run more on first down and then force turnovers and continue to take care of the ball. And the third game, a third thing is you got to win with a kicking game. You can't be good. You can't be okay. We lose to, um, well, the Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl's lost because of a fumble punt and a, a blocked extra point. We lose to West Virginia because of two interceptions going in, turnovers, and a muff punt and a punt return for a touchdown. And that's without Drake and, and three other of our, our great players. We still could win the game. So let's figure out, let's, let's quit talking about being bad or being good and bad being average, being inconsistent, and let's get good at it. We've got a great staff. We've got great kids. There's no reason that we can't win um, all the games, and that's just on us. How often are you in a staff meeting or at a practice or around staff and sort of have to jerk a knot in someone, as Meemaw would say, jerk a knot in them and say just what you said? I know what's wrong. It's obvious what's wrong. It's obvious that this wasn't executed, but... It's not, that, that, that's a 19 year old. You've got three decades in this business. How about we figure it out? How often do you actually have to vocalize that to guys? I've got a great staff and, and, um, Josh, another great thing about being 72 is you, you're going to say what you think and you're going to tell the truth. Um, we agree to disagree and there is no elephant in the room in our staff meetings. I, I took the inside drill yesterday and I showed it to our defensive coaches and said, I'm, I'm sick of these five plays. I've seen these for five years. I don't want to see this anymore. He's too high. He's too soft. He's too, and so that's just who we are. And we do it every day. And, and they are with me. This is a very close staff. So when I'm, I'm not getting on them, I told them, uh, I give you suggestions and I want you to look at them. I'm going to make the decisions. You make suggestions. I make decisions. And assistant coaches jobs are easier because you can make suggestions, and they don't change people's lives. I have to make decisions. They change people's lives. So you don't, don't walk around and bitch about me not taking your opinion for your thoughts uh, because I've, I've got to put everything together and make a decision for the group. I don't make it for you. 
and and we we do a good job of that. I don't I I, I don't coach players at practice. I don't coach coaches on the field, but I write down every little thing I see that a coach needs to do to get better, and I bring it in and tell him. How different do you run a practice now than you would have 20 years ago? Or is it different at all? Uh, I'm, I'm the, the best coach now I've ever been. Um, I'm, I've made so many mistakes that I, I look back and say, oh, in fact, some of the, the players in my really early years, I apologize to now when I see them. <laughs> I said, listen, some of those things I said, some of the things we did, I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but but now we're more efficient. We, I can't stand not being organized. I can't stand the, the practice not to go smooth and quick and know where to go. I hate it when a coach has to say, hey, Josh, come here, man. You're in the wrong drill. That means we're not organized. So I, 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 my, my whole focus is time efficiency, making sure that we let's don't practice drills that aren't going to help him do better against his opponent. Don't have a drill because it's a drill. You have a drill because it helps him win, man. Your, your job is to help him get better against his opponent. And if you don't do that, what's your worth? He's not going to respect you if he's not getting better. He wants to get better. That's your job. So uh, have efficient drills. Uh, make sure that they stay healthy. Um, if a guy gets hurt because he hits somebody, you got it. But don't get one a stupid drill that wasn't even effective anyway. And you get some guy hurt, and and make sure that you're we're, we're, we haven't done a good job here of developing depth. We we need to play. Uh, we need 22 people on offense and defense all the time to be playing. That's why we we lose at the end of the year. We wear out. We get tired. We get people hurt. We got to play more people. And to do that, you've got to coach them well enough that you trust them. And then you tell the player, I, I don't want you to tell me that you love football. You're going to. I want you to show me. If you're late to meetings, you, you, you don't care. Either you don't have respect for me or you, you don't care enough about football to show up because you know we want you to show up. If you're using drugs or, or uh, excessive alcohol or staying out late, you, you know, you're saying I don't care. I don't care as much about football as I do these things, none of which are good for me. So you just uh, you need to show me, man. Show me if you want to play or not. And that's what I've told the team. We're, we're that 8-9 win group. You're going to have to give up some things to, to get um, past that. Uh, C.L. Shepard came in and spoke to our team, and he's a great speaker. And I didn't know where he was going. It was a true story. He said there's, there's a guy out in Arizona and he's in the desert, and he's hiking, and he's by himself, and he's got his cell phone and a knife. That's all he's got. And a boulder falls, and he gets caught, and his arm gets caught in it. And he can't get his arm out. And he can't get a hold of anybody because he's got no service, and he's going to starve. So he takes out his knife and cuts off his arm. And then he, he hikes, finds somebody, and they save his life. So CL's message was, you got some things in your life you need to cut out. Are you willing to do that to, to get to where you need to go? He had to cut off his arm to save his life. What do you need to cut off? Hmm. What do you need to cut off to save your life? And, and it was so true. Then Coach Dungey said the other day, uh, how many people want to win the ACC championship next year? Well, that's all of us. How many people want to win a national championship? It's all of us. He said, okay. What are you willing to give up? So it was kind of the same message. And he said, what are you willing to give up? And he said, we're the receivers. They were all sitting back there together. And he said, oh, good, you're all together. Uh, so you want to win all the games, right? You want to win the national championship, right? Yeah, that's great. How many are you willing not to catch one ball next year and still win all the games? And they went, hmm. <laughs> he said, yeah. That's the question. What are people in this room willing to give up to win all the games? That's kind of where we are in our life. You give up a lot to travel and work as hard as you do and get where you are at your age. A lot of people aren't willing to do that, but they'd rather gripe at you. And the truth is, you, you, you're, you're going to get back what you put in. And, and it may take a while. may not be on your schedule. But that, that's what the, the, the power of this position is to try to help those young guys learn how to manage a very difficult life. We, we can't control what happens to us. We can control how we handle it. And that's what our whole program is based on. Can you think back over your years 
and identify specific things you had to cut out or change in your personal life to maximize your own effectiveness? Oh, yeah. I, I, COVID, I got too heavy. Didn't even realize it. And I got on the scale one day and I said, ooh. Mm. So old CL comes in. So I lost 43 pounds. And I've, I've got back up a little bit with recruiting. So I got to go back and make sure I, I do it. But I thought, here I am telling these kids, you got to discipline what you eat and your conditioning and all that. And I'm too heavy. So what's that message? I mean, look in the mirror, man. So I just said I got to do it. I got I got to say now for the people watching, I walked in the building today and Jeremy's showing us around and we walk in the lunchroom and there's head coach Mac Brown and seated three feet away is a nutritionist <laughs> yeah. watching every bite. No. So this is being practiced. Well, this is that, not just that, that, is, that is true. And I love uh, my wife, Sally, when she's here, we eat lunch with the players every day. Because, and that's a great setup in this building, but I want to see their faces. And if you walk by and I say, Josh, how are you doing? And you say, all right, I, I know something's wrong. And if we think something's wrong, something's wrong. So then you got to say, oh, come here, what you got? What's going on? There's something wrong. That's the purpose of the coach. On one hand, I know you want to be as regimented as possible. On the other hand, you just mentioned a day-to-day -day instance where you could have the need to carve out 40 minutes on the fly where one of your players needs you immediately. How hard is it to be or remain that flexible, but also try and maintain structure? It, it's, uh, it's hard, but, but I am um, a nut for routine. But uh, players and staff are priority. So if one of those players says, I got a problem, we'll move a staff meeting, we'll do anything to go to him immediately. So that's just, that's just what we do. When I was up in your office earlier, I don't think I've been in one where guys have multiple pictures with multiple former presidents of the United States. And that was like just in the top 15 of some of the more amazing things that were on the shelves. So your office is like a museum, basically. Uh, what are some of your favorite things up there? Because I assume you can close your eyes and just picture it all. Well, uh, again, Sally's very important in my life and our process. And we had all these things stuck in a shelf in a house or they were in a closet or in a little box. And she said, you need to share these with people. And I, I don't like talking about me anyway, but she does. So <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, and I've had such a blessed life. I mean, I just, it's amazing. I, uh, when I get to Texas, President Bush is the governor and he's working out in our weight room about every day. So I got close to him and then his dad got close and President Obama came to, to, do a uh, um, uh, what one of the um, um, what do we call it the uh, he and Hillary were doing uh, oh the debates uh, debates and, and they were doing it right behind their building so I emailed President Obama and said would you have time to come by and speak to the he was senator at that time would you come by, have time to come by and speak to the team God he spent an hour and a half <laughs> uh, and then he came back to see us later and and um, and President Clinton came here. Uh, in the early 90s, and, and I'm not even Republican or Democrat. I, I was told by Coach Royal, uh, head coach at Texas, a long time ago, don't vote, man. You got enough of them mad at you anyway, so uh, you, you need to stay away from politics. So I can remember when President Clinton was walking down the hall, and Sally and I were standing there, and I said, is he Republican or Democrat? <laughs> if, if somebody asked me, uh, she said, just shut up and just be the coach. And uh, But it, it's... Uh, the relationship with the coaches I've had in this business, the Coach Bowdens, the Coach Paternos, the Coach Royals, uh, Coach Shim Becklers. I mean, it's just those, those. It's why I want to be helpful to the younger coaches if I can, because the older guys were helpful to me. And I look around now and I'm one of those older guys. Um, and, and then uh, the Hall of Fame ring is probably the most important thing in there because, Josh, it touches everybody who has ever worked with me or played for me. I can tell them your part of you is in the Hall of Fame with that ring. Uh, it's really hard to win a national championship, so that trophy, uh, that team is special to me because, uh, as Coach Royal said, it changes your life, but then you're going to want to win another one. So it, it really screws you up in, in some ways. Um, so probably those, those two or three things. I, um, I'm just so blessed. You think most people don't ever get to be a head coach. If they do, they probably get fired in the first three to five years. 
I've got 36 years of kids and staff that are my family. So when Father's Day comes around or Christmas comes around or January 1st, I just get so many texts and I love them sending me their pictures of their family. And, and then I can think back to, oh my God, he has changed. Thank goodness. <laughs> Uh, and I laugh at them and say the the my hair is gray because of you, man. You're you're the one that did it. Uh, but even coming back here when we were out, a lot of people wanted us to get back in coaching, and we weren't going to go somewhere where we couldn't win without cheating, and we weren't going to go somewhere where we didn't want to live. And we came back here when they they put you in the Hall of Fame. They say you got a year to to go back and say thank you to people before you get inducted. So I said I I got that. So I went to Tulane. I went to App State. I went to Texas and. I came here. When we came here, there were about 200 kids, and it was amazing how many of them said, do you remember when I was a sophomore and you <laughs> said, I'm thinking, how would I remember that? No. And he said, it changed my life. Do you remember coming to my dad's funeral? Do you remember my wedding? And, do you? and we walked out that night, and Sally said, I haven't seen you this happy since you left Texas. So if this job comes open, you need to be interested in it. Um, so I think just that room, it's about the people it's about the relationships more than anything else. We've got a charity now, and, and the charity in Austin is making $11 million a year for, uh, to empower kids that need money. Uh, just so many blessings just pop up in my life every day. And uh, the only thing I have trouble with, Josh, it, it's funny. I told, the, I told the team, as a head coach, I hate it when you get in trouble. Because it, it gets out of my control, and that changes your life. And you're at a young age where you probably don't even realize how much it changes your life. So I hate it when you get hurt, because I got hurt. I had uh, eight knee operations. Two of them were knee replacements. So I couldn't ever get where I wanted to be as an athlete because I stayed hurt. So I hate that for you. And I hate it when they can't play. we got 120 guys. And if you're acting right and busting your tail... Only 11 get to play at a time. So unlike basketball, they can play eight of the 13. Uh, we've got most of our team has some depression and, and gets down and, and, and really struggles because they don't get to play. So those three things to me are things that I can't control that really bother me as a head coach. The other one is I hate losing. And, and it, it sounds like you're patting yourself on the back. Oh, I'm, I'm, I compete. I'm tough. All that. It's really not. I, I want to, I'm a pleaser. And I want us to do everything right. And I've got a university depending on me. I've got, uh, administrators. I've got supporters. I've got a lot of friends in coaching. I've got all these kids. I got these families. I got this staff. So when we, in my mind, should have won. If the other team's better than we are and they just line up and whip us and we play good, I'm fine. I, I can go home and say, don't schedule them again. Or <laughs> something. I mean, but they're better than we are. Uh, but when we lose a game that we should win, I just, it really eats me up. And I promised Sally when I came back I'd, I'd be better at losing. I'm not. I lied. I, and I, I guess you can't be, but that's the, that's the only thing in this business those four things are the things that I just don't handle very well. How are you handling the whole retirement question whenever it comes up these days? When I, I got at, at Texas after 30 years, I was tired, and I didn't realize I was tired. Um, and 16 years at Texas, Sally calls it four presidential terms, so that's <laughs> a long time. Um, so I started talking about retiring, and I started working on what's the best, what's best for everybody and when you do that, you don't do as well. So I said this time, I, I knew, I talked to Bill Snyder at Kansas State, uh, and I said, would you have gone back in again? Yeah, you love coaching, you, you need to do that. And I didn't finish like I wanted to at Texas. Um, he said, so when you go back in, just don't think about retiring. Don't talk about retiring. And I thought about it when, when Nick retired. Um, I said, as long as I'm having fun, and as long as I feel like I'm the best coach for North Carolina and I'm being productive, I'm fine. The day I get up and don't want to come to work or the day I get up and don't want to go recruit or I think we don't have a chance or I'm not the best guy for the job, I'll just quit. But I, I, I don't think about quitting because then I think I'm, I'm hurting us if I think about quitting. 
And, and that's what I've told every kid. The, they, they said that Nick told them when you said, uh, you're going to be here the next four years. He said, are you <laughs> with a transfer portal? I don't even know if you're going to be here for, uh, but <clears throat> I don't worry about that because if we bring a kid here, North Carolina is a great place. And they're going to hire a great coach when I'm gone. So I, I don't I don't feel like I'm cutting him short, uh, but I'm planning on coaching. So I also don't feel like I'm lying to him either. And there will be a day I'll quit. And I'm, I'm trying to be healthy as it's one of the reasons for losing the weights and, and got grandkids. I want to play basketball with them and play baseball with them and do play golf with them. And uh, but I, I'm, I'm at a great place in my life because I'm doing what I want to do. I'm having fun doing it. And I'm pushing myself every day to, to try to get better and win all the games. Let's wrap it up on this. Go literally anywhere you want to on this. When they ask you at the end of the run, maybe it's 2040 for all we know, but at the end of the run when they say, hey, what's the most valuable lesson you've learned along that coaching journey, what direction does your mind go? My mind goes that uh, um, my granddad, who I love dearly, he was the winningest coach in, in Middle Tennessee history, and I was around him every minute of every day. And he taught me most of what I know. He always said, always do what you know is the right thing to do. And I will, I will be able to leave coaching saying I always did what I knew was the right thing to do. Maybe I could have won more games. Uh, maybe if you break rules, that's okay because it's hard to catch you now more than ever before. I've always wanted my granddad to be proud, and I always want my children and my grandchildren to look at me and say, you know what, he was a good man, and he always did what he knew was the right thing to do. And I think, Josh, that's the most important thing to me. I'm, I'm going to do what's right with these kids. Uh, I'm going to treat these players like I would want my son to be treated and like I would treat my son. And that's what it got to be with the Tez Walker situation. And any of ours that get accused of something they didn't do, man, I'm going to fight for them like I fight for my son. Uh, but but that's, that, that's who I am and that's who I want to be, and, and I'm not going to change that. And our coaches look at me and say, you know everybody's cheating. <laughs> and I said, I don't care. We are going to do things right. And that's the message to our players, that I don't care what other people are doing. It doesn't make it okay if our opponent is cheating for us to cheat, to catch up. What we've got to do is do a better job with what we've got and be more organized than them and coach better than them and still beat them within the right way. And that's what I want when I'm through. This has been a phenomenal visit. Head Coach Mac Brown. Thank you, Josh. It. Thank you.